Hey, and welcome to our second episode of Anthropological Inquiries. We're here with uh, Dr. Dr. Marty Otanez today. We're going to be talking about the anthropology of cannabis, uh, which I think is a pretty interesting and unique uh, topic since you can only really do that research in a few states currently in the United States. Um, so uh, to introduce Dr. Otanez, um, um, Marty Otanez is a California-born cultural anthropologist and filmmaker. Uh, he's an associate professor at CU Denver. Um, uh, his research uh, all includes uh, digital storytelling, uh, tobacco, and now cannabis. So. Um, uh, Dr. Otanez also has his own series uh, here on YouTube, actually. It's called Getting High on Anthropology. You can check out his channel, which I've linked below in the info. So, uh, um, so uh, Dr. Otanez, will you tell us a little bit about your background and your research? And uh, let, let's start with the tobacco stuff. What, what kind of stuff are you looking at with the tobacco stuff? Excellent. And Michael, thank you so much for um, having me as a guest. I'm looking forward to our conversation and um, very happy to be able to just share some things with you. And many of the things I'm going to share with you are ongoing. Um, but a little bit of background, I got my PhD in Irvine in 2004, University of California, Irvine. That PhD, the doctoral work, was focusing on the tobacco industry, uh, mostly in a country called Malawi in Central Africa. The purpose of my work in the tobacco sector, which is still ongoing today, is to try to understand the lived experiences of men, women, and children who produce tobacco for global companies, cigarette companies and leaf buying companies, and just try to understand what workers are doing to assert their rights as workers and to have you know dignity in the tobacco fields. Uh, so that work is ongoing, and I think definitely the background of working in the global tobacco sector, especially farming, has provided me a great foundation to just hop over into cannabis, primarily because it's in our like on our uh, front lawn here in Denver. So I'm strategically placed to you know do ethnographic work, do visual analysis, uh, do interviews, and so I easily glommed on to cannabis as a research area. Uh, primarily because, number one, I'm interested to understand how to normalize cannabis as a, a legal, uh, recreational, and, and medical um, commodity for people to use for different reasons. So I'm, I'm interested to use my position, my knowledge to help normalize the sector. Simultaneously, I want this sector to work better for more people. So my main focal point has been labor issues in the cannabis sector here in Denver, Colorado generally. Uh, and so right now I'm just wrapping up a uh, data analysis of a survey I administered last fall, fall 2016, with uh, 17 cannabis workers and managers in cultivation facilities. And so I'm just at the beginning uh, or tail end of analyzing that and then writing it up into you know chapters, articles, and, um, and doing some visual work alongside that. All right. So uh, you mentioned ethnographic. Uh, research. So, so tell us what is an anthropology of cannabis, and how does like the holistic approach of uh, anthropology apply or or provide a specific kind of or useful lens to uh, this kind of research? Excellent. Yeah, great questions, and I really appreciate you being interested in this because, as you know, I think anthropologists struggle to make our work relevant and to build bridges of understanding with people. So just to be clear, I'm a cultural anthropologist, uh, and I also have sort of um, additional hats I wear. I'm a visual or digital anthropologist. I'm also a medical anthropologist, a policy anthropologist, but a cultural anthropologist sort of brings to this issue the idea of the cannabis itself as a commodity, as a process uh, that provides a window into cultural change in 2017. And so what I bring to the table in my area of focus is looking at the product, looking at cannabis production, and just trying to understand along the cannabis commodity chain, the different um, uh, sort of uh, elements or segments along that uh, cultivation chain or commodity chain and to try to understand the lived experiences of people who are devoting their labor to the production of uh, cannabis. So as an anthropologist, I bring a uh, theoretical applied approach, which means, you know, understanding the history of anthropology, uh, intellectual foundation that can help me make sense of what's going on, but then also in the applied area to try to understand how can I leverage my position 
to uh, make the sector, make the cannabis commodity, make the process of cannabis production be more responsive to those men and women that uh, devote their labor to the production of it. And so one of the outcomes, if things go well, are, you know, policy recommendations to encourage, uh, you know, better workplace protections, try to understand what workers could do to assert their rights to ensure they're getting fairly compensated for the labor that they put into the production of cannabis. What kind of, uh, what kind of trouble do workers face or what kind of risks do they take working in this industry? So I think a, a general pattern I've seen is not necessarily specific to cannabis, but in general, if you go to any workplace and you begin to ask people how they like their job, what's working well, what's not working well, and then drill down to like, are they happy with the payment they're getting for their, you know, hourly wage? Are they happy with their, um, you know, workplace protections or grievance procedures or the ability to get a, a schedule on a regular basis? So I found a number of sort of, uh, um, routine complaints um, and a number of things that are working uh, well. Um, specific to cannabis, the issue that I'm mostly interested in that uh, jumped out of the data was um, the issue of powdery mildew. So when uh, trimmers, individuals that cut leaves um, and prepare the cannabis for the shelves, when they do their work, uh, they're sitting for hours and they get exposed to mold and powdery mildew. And that is a function of maybe uh, poor ventilation or maybe not the best growing practices or even related to indoor cultivation, which tends to breed, um, you know, or create an environment where there's a higher level of powdery mildew. So I was mostly interested and got data to understand workers' perceptions about the problem of powdery mildew and then what are they, do what are they doing to... Um, uh, protect their health and avoid respiratory problems or any kind of rashes on their on their skin. Sure, I also um, read somewhere about uh, repetitive motion injury injuries from things like trimming. Is that is that like a serious concern, or is that just like uh, you know uh, like any other job if you type too much or, or something like that? Yeah, definitely in um, the cannabis production process where you have people sitting down for hours um, trimming, um, you know, with scissors and they're at a table and they have a tray and some gloves. If you do that over and over, yeah, there's um, a number of ergonomic issues that, that come up. It could be sore wrists, sore shoulders, um, even uh, problems with dust, uh, breathing in dust. And so I think the er ergonomic issue is probably as important uh, at least in my findings, uh, in terms of what individuals said was a priority for them in terms of their concerns, uh, ergonomic issues, powdery mildew mold, exposure to uh, pesticides. Uh, there were some issues that people thought uh, things could be done better and there could be better training or there could be better, um, uh, you know, just protections to ensure that when they go into the workplace, they don't come out with, you know, worse than they came in in terms of their physical, um, uh, you know, their shape that they're, that they're in. Sure, sure. Uh, so uh, another question. So there might be some viewers out there who aren't interested in cannabis uh, because they don't partake or maybe, you know, there's a lot of people out there. It's still very controversial because it's illegal and still in most of our states. Um, but and you, you said that some of your research is trying to normalize uh, the use of cannabis. Uh, so could you tell us, uh, is there any benefits to uh, cannabis for those who don't partake in, in, uh, in using it? Uh, beside, you know, obviously exclude the medical because there, there's obviously plenty of uh, medical demonstrable medical benefits. But there are, are there other uses for cannabis uh, that that uh, people have talked about. Yeah, I mean, it, within the cannabis sector itself, um, I mean, it's understood that it's pleasurable and it's fun. And as we know in our society, people are thirsty for pleasure and having fun. And um, if you contrast cannabis use as well as you know um, other things people do with with the with medicine and then you look at alcohol it, it's a no-brainer in terms of the social impact the devastation on families with um, alcoholism and, and other things that that come out of that problem so I think for non cannabis people people who are just on the outside looking in what's fascinating is that we're seeing a industry grow from scratch you know it was underground now it's above ground so it's a very fascinating process to see how our regulatory system our legal system our uh, socio ecological environments deal with this um, major change going on in our society so it's really just fascinating to understand it 
and I definitely don't subscribe to the prohibitionist ideology that some people have. Um, I just feel based on research and data and people I've talked with, you know, the drug war, it, it, it's a failed um, drug war in, in our society. And I think um, it makes perfect sense to provide this plant, this medicine available for people if they want to use it. Um, and then it also is an incredible vehicle to understand how our society has this addiction to chemicals, synthetic drugs. And so cannabis, it's really good to educate ourselves to what extent, if at all, could cannabis be used as a way to maybe lessen the severity of the problems associated with our um, epidemic of synthetic drugs and opioids in the United States. Sure, sure, sure. Um, and I also, too, I was kind of leaning towards, I know that some people talk about hemp clothing, they talk about hempcrete, uh, you know, uh, building sustainable systems around hemp. Are, are you familiar with any of that stuff? Yeah, gosh, great questions. Yeah, there's so much to talk about in terms of um, hemp and the different uh, possibilities with it. Early on in the year 2001, with one of my tobacco-related projects, I, I had an event where I screened one of my first videos, and I had some gifts for people who attended, and one of the gifts was a hemp t-shirt. And so I learned early on, you know, this was in the early 2000s, that anything except uh, glass or um, uh, steel, anything could be made using, uh, products can be made uh, using hemp. So anything, it can't substitute for glass, it can't substitute for steel, but anything else, it can be made into a product. And it could be a tangible item like a sweater, um, blankets, a house, you know, out of hempcrete, but it also could be uh, food, you know, nutritious foods for people. And so in Colorado, I think we are one of the pioneering states, you know, developing our hemp, our hemp industry. Um, there's still a couple legal hurdles, I think, that need to be overcome, but the, the hemp sector is vibrant, and I think everyone, if they can, should support it in whatever way, whether it's purchasing uh, hemp uh, produced items or requesting stores to carry uh, these items. And and I think people should also visit a store dispensary and just ask questions because there's many helpful people that work in these stores who are happy to talk with people about hemp. Or you can also go online and look at, um, uh, you know, the there's hemp associations in Colorado. You can uh, see what they have in terms of the literature and other information. Sure, sure. Uh, another thing I saw, uh, and um, uh, for full disclosure, uh, Marty and I have worked on a couple of uh, videos together or conferences uh, involving this issue. Um, but uh, uh, one of the things I saw is that there is a uh, an interesting problem with uh, resources and uh, water, uh, water and power specifically when it comes to uh, the production of cannabis and that uh, you know there's a, a massive increase of the use of of both those things uh what what kind of uh, in, uh stuff have you found out about uh those particular uh issues especially you know you talk about uh, po ma major power increases to uh heat and cool these plants so that they 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 are produced because they have to be produced inside so yeah, again, really great questions. And there's a couple ways to respond. Um, I'm not an expert in the environmental costs of cannabis production, but there's certain things I've learned on this journey. Um, the first thing is, if you look at the culture of cannabis, especially those who are really into it and, you know, they're into uh, home grows, they're into the consumption of it, they're into, uh, you know, the legalization of it. There's this, um, if you go underneath the veneer of this culture, you know, this subculture or counterculture, there's some hypocrisy with it. You know, there's people who really love the cannabis as medicine or as a recreational uh, substance. Um, but when you talk about the environmental issues, um, you know, the fact is that cannabis has a fairly large carbon footprint, especially in Colorado due to electricity use, due to water use. But I think many people, you know, there's some people trying to do something about it, but many people just sort of poo-poo and that just, they say that's just the cost of our sector. And then maybe down the line, we can address it better. I know there are sustainability groups in Colorado, as in any other industry. So there's really smart people trying to work on these issues. But like many other industries, especially my experience with the tobacco sector, you may find, and I found this to be the case, where you get corporations, you know, industry representatives from cannabis companies getting onto these committees and really diluting 
any rigorous regulations or anything that could uh, have a demonstrated impact. Uh, and I think because two things are going on, companies want to demonstrate to the public that they care about the environment. So they're trying to make themselves look like they're, you know, friends of, of forests and, you know, they care about water and they have all these incredibly, you know, fancy recycling programs. But at the same time, they don't want to necessarily spend more money to, to implement effective programs within the facilities that uh, equate to sustainable programs. So I think the issue here is consumer education, uh, getting consumers to maybe ask questions about the environmental impact or the carbon footprint. And then of course, understanding to what extent uh, could we document how companies obstruct legislation that is designed to make uh, some of the laws uh, more rigorous in terms of environmental protections. Sure. And so uh, this uh, will easily kind of transition in my next question, which is, uh, you know, how has this kind of transition to big business been for this industry? Because, you know, obviously, first, this was an underground industry. And then when it first began, it was all mom and pop kind of places. And obviously, now, since it's been legalized for several years, uh, it's transitioning to much larger companies. Uh, and, and so uh, what have you, cause you, you've been uh, in this process uh, right from the beginning, correct? So I'm, I'm sort of a newbie because there's been people, you know, involved for 10, 20 years, you know, working on, um, you know, trying to create a context where marijuana could be legalized in Colorado. And I've been, um, you know, to backpedal a little in the, when I was in this late seventies and eighties growing up high school, um, you know, college, I was a firm participant and firm believer in cannabis um, uh, as a as an item for people for pleasure. Um, I can't say I use it for medical reasons. It was really just for pleasure. And so I, but back then during my formative years, I was really interested in understanding it, participating in it, you know, enjoying it. And then as I got older, as a researcher, as a professor, it just made perfect sense for nostalgic reasons because I had so many positive memories and for intellectual reasons to get into this. And so, yeah, since I got into it in uh, fall of, uh, of 2014, maybe summer 2014, there's no doubt, I mean, this is a capitalistic enterprise. Um, you can talk about big cannabis, you can talk about corporations. If it weren't for the capital behind many of these companies that helped sort of grease the regulatory and legislative uh, frameworks, there wouldn't have been any uh, legalization of, of cannabis. So there's many companies with a lot of money that are involved. And over time, what I'm learning, there's been a sort of uh, consolidation where the larger companies are buying uh, or squeezing out the smaller companies. And so again, from an anthropological point of view, to try to understand um, you know, how cannabis how cannabis capitalism and how anthropology can understand this process, it's really interesting um, under along economic lines, along, along policy making lines, and then of course along um, consumer lines, how consumers are purchasing a product that they get pleasure from or find there's healing uh, properties there, but also there's like big business. And um, uh, I think, uh, you know, extreme capitalism embedded in the commodity because that capital, those business people, these shareholders pretty much have one thing that is on their mind and that's making profits and increasing the rate of profits over time. Of course. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's kind of the old, the, uh, uh, the typical, uh, uh, mentality with any industry, right, is, is trying to increase production, you know, consolidate those kind of things. We see this across all kinds of different uh, products, even media. Uh, the consolidation of media has been extraordinarily damaging in the past uh, 30 or 40 years, especially. Um, hey, hey, Michael, let me add um, one thing. Uh, sure. What's interesting about cannabis as, um, you know, a capitalist enterprise is um you know companies they they there's good companies out there they they want to do the right thing but i think what we're finding is um you know the companies are are claiming you know that they're not making a lot of money and so in uh, with my work and others to hold the companies accountable to some of their bad practices you know many of the much of the discourse is that they're taxed so much so that companies are not having the revenue or maybe the profits that people think they're having. And so I, I, I kind of buy this argument, but at the same time, 
then okay, the companies should be transparent and they should show us the numbers to determine, you know, what amount of money are they actually making? Uh, because every two months, there's some new number that comes out about how we've surpassed a billion dollars this year in sales of, of cannabis. And I, I think the the problem again not specific to cannabis but the problem is there's only a few people making a lot of money and that seems to be um one of the things i'm drawn to to understand how to make the sector better work better for more people but also to understand how to build accountability and transparency in the sector uh is that also driven by uh for those of you who don't know it's a cash based only industry at the moment or, or have they changed that uh last uh, last i was reading was that um, you know, you don't have any banks that will allow uh, them to do business. So it's, it's largely a cash based, cash based industry. Is that, is that part of the problem? Uh, I think that's a minor part of the problem. I know that there's been some changes and, you know, you can go to these uh, facilities and they do take credit cards. So there's been some progress with the infrastructure of banking uh, facilities being uh, receptive and available for business people uh, to, to, you know, do their daily, you know, um, transactions. So, so there's been some improvement. And I think we're at a situation now where people and again, I'm my limited experience in the sector. I mean, people, there's this element of uncertainty because of the current Trump administration and how they're going to crack down or not um, with cannabis and whether or not they're going to actually implement federal law. And so I think there's some people that maybe are a little skittish and a little bit timid, but others who are, you know, full on uh, plowing ahead as capitalists, as business people, uh, seeing this idea idea that the genie's been let out of the bottle and we're too far gone for it to be put back in and um and 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 go, gone underground or made illegal um so there's we're in this uh moment of uncertainty and we'll know maybe in the next few months or within the year what may happen um uh, at the federal level with the trump administration sure so so let's talk about that for a second because obviously it's still uh, a federal cl crime but at a state level it's legal so does that impact uh, the workers? I, I, I've heard some stories about things like, uh, you know, um, uh, even though it's legal, companies still do drug testings and they can still fire uh, their employees, not, not obviously cannabis employees, obviously they're not going to fire their employees, but, uh, but so you still see a lot of conflict in those kind of situations. Do you, do you see any uh, personal risk for individual employees of the cannabis sector uh, because this is still technically a federal offense? I think the risk is there, um, but I think it's so minor in in terms of like there's people, you know, flocking, you know, cannabis migrants or trimmigrants. There's people coming to Colorado for the jobs. And I think the people that come for work weigh the benefits and costs. And I think the risk of, let's say, the federal government going into a facility and shutting it down because it's illegal because that risk is real and it's there, but I don't think people um, have it at the front of their mind because number one, many of these workers absolutely love cannabis. So like they're in this job where they're working around, you know, these plants that are beautiful to look at, they smell nice and they get to consume regularly, you know, if there are consumers of, of cannabis. So I don't think the, the fear is, um, is huge, but it's definitely there. And I know in Colorado, there hasn't been um, any major evidence of, you know, people um, leaving the sector because they're unsure about, you know, their position in their job. Sure. Um, so this might be like kind of a broad question, uh, but what's, what is cannabis culture? And could you could you give us kind of a picture of that? Uh, are there certain cultural trends or patterns that you've kind of experienced? And and then how do you how do you kind of come up with those, those kind of ideas? What kind of data methods are you or research methods are you using to kind of analyze this particular culture? Okay, yeah, good. Um, really fundamental questions that we tackle as anthropologists. So my approach to culture you know, as a professor, as a researcher, as a community member, is to engage with, with the culture. Um, and so that means, you know, being a, a, a consumer, that means being a supporter of the sector, that means being present at different meetings and different functions. I'm on the board of a few different nonprofit groups, and so I'm able to use my position there. So the culture is a process of people coming together 
um, having different relationships that are constantly in flux and then also, you know, doing things that they have sort of a like minded um, vision of, of creating cannabis as something that's normal and also learning from each other and building like a community of practice that is in support of, of, of cannabis. So culture is also you know, visual, highly visual. And so there's a dimension or segments within cannabis culture where you can isolate just the visual imagery and the different um, uh, photographs and different illustrations and different, um, you know, kinds of images that embody uh, the change in sector, whether it's, you know, a female bud tender at the counter or a beautiful pot leaf. So I'm interested in um, the culture also visually as a way to create counter stereotypes to some of those the stigma that exists in sort of traditional society that cannabis like is this bad thing or the devil's lettuce so in terms of research methods so as an anthropologist you know my main thing is you know for us to do the work effectively you need to really like people and enjoy being around people and so i spend time uh, having informal conversations with people, uh, whether it's a policymaker, whether it's a, um, a ordinary employee, uh, a you know uh, another researcher, and so through informal conversations, gathering information that can help me then um, form questions to do semi-structured interviews. So semi-structured interviews would be you know me with a a trimmer, for example, uh, just discussing with them their job. Uh, having a conversation with them and really it's just sharing stories because to get the really good data the real good cultural information um it's not a one-way process it's a conversation where i'm trying to build trust and also understand you know from their perspective what's going on with their life in the particular areas that i'm interested in and so those um uh, semi-structured interviews are also complemented by a structured survey so I had a survey about you know 80 items or 80 questions long, and individuals would um, contact me after they heard about the study. They would complete a um, consent form, which is a required form when you do research. And then um, as part of the process, they would fill the survey out and then um, get a gift card for the time that they spent. Um, another um, uh, method I use is also a video. So participants that I interviewed so for example, 17 people completed surveys, and this is a small pilot or exploratory study. So 17 people completed surveys. Four of those had the opportunity to be guests on my television show called um, Getting High on Anthropology through Denver Open Media. So I had the visual um, uh, you know, media as part of a data collection to analyze and understand the imagery, but also the, the content of what they, what they said. And then the final method, which is a little bit above my pay grade, but I wanted to use it because I wanted to get quantitative data. Quantitative data. So I worked with a industrial hygienist, and we collected uh, spore samples or mold um, spores uh, on these settle plates, which basically means for 10 minutes in a grow room, we would collect uh, uh, spore samples to determine the number of spores that existed to see whether or not uh, the mold was an actual problem for workers along respiratory lines. So that um, that part of the study didn't work out as well as I wanted it to because I didn't get many companies to agree to have me come in to determine the amount of mold spores in their facility. And it could be I poorly advertise or it could just be employers don't want some of this information public because it could make a product or a certain kind of um, you know merchandise not look so appealing to the public if it was known to have powdery mildew. Sure, sure. Yeah, I would. Um, yeah, I could see why they wouldn't necessarily want to volunteer for that particular thing. Is that is that something you would necessarily pursue at a policy level? That maybe that should be a part of the policy to make sure that there is a minimum amount of uh, mildew and mold. Well, I think in terms of policy, um, you know, again, everything is still being worked out because it's such a new or early um, industry. There's workplace protections that are already there, for example, for agricultural workers that um, apply or relate to cannabis workers. So there's things that exist, um, but I think there's a few different issues. One is enforcement. Um, enforcement of the existing regulations is a bit challenging because 
again, we're so early in the industry, so so there's um, not a lot of enforcement happening, or maybe it could be scaled up or done better. And then the other thing is there's also, um, uh, you know, people trying to understand with the federal government making or looking at marijuana as illegal, the federal government has OSHA, which is, you know, the Occupational Health and Safety Group, but there hasn't been a lot of effort at the federal level to increase or ratchet up um, specific uh, workplace protections and safety rules for cannabis because it's illegal at the federal level. And so there's some effort by OSHA do, to, to do some studies or some studies done recently to document and just tally some of the issues and what needs to be done. But there's more work that needs to be done in terms of um, clarifying the existing regulations and then also passing um, more optimal regulations that could protect workers to ensure that they're uh, healthy and safe when they produce cannabis. So I'm hopeful in the next six to m months or 12 months that we're going to see, uh, you know, more visibility to existing regulations and laws that cover workers in the cannabis sector. Sure, sure. So has there been anything um, really unexpected you've found you've come up with in your research or anything you've come across that you maybe didn't consider or that you had to kind of take a new path because, you know, there were some roadblocks or anything like that? Well, the biggest roadblock is I designed the study to understand Latinos and other people of color who work in the sector. And so when I formulated this research project um, a couple years ago, when I started to actually look at the data and talk with people, there were not a lot of people of color who had um, you know, badges which are required by the state of Colorado to work in the facilities. And so I just then had to tinker with the study and say, I'll look for any workers who would be willing to talk with me. And so sadly, um, there are, of course, people of color that work in the industry. There are Latinos, there's African Americans and others, but there's very few of them. And I don't think the demographics of the workforce necessarily reflect the demographics of the state. Um, and so most of the uh, 17 of the people I did surveys with who completed the surveys were white um, individuals. And so uh, if I was to modify the study or do it over the long term, I would try to understand the experiences of people of color in the sector, um, primarily because what I'm learning, it is lily white. Um, and I'm not just talking about the workforce. If you put a picture up on the screen of, let's say, the five top companies and looked at all of their board of directors, there will be all white faces. And so the the whiteness and the racialization of the sector is really fascinating. Um, and I'm trying to understand it, number one, and then also try to see what could be done at a policy level to make sure people of color have access to capital to either be business people or can fairly and in a reasonable way work in the sector despite maybe some um, past problems they've had, you know, with their, um, you know, being arrested for possession or some other uh, problem that they had with the law in the past. Do you think that, um, uh, you know, because uh, people of color are overrepresented in the prison system and a lot of that does have to do with cannabis, uh, do you think that's part of the problem? I mean, I know, um, I worked in a courthouse uh, briefly when I lived in Oregon uh, for about a year, and I noticed, you know, I, I, one of the things I did was file misdemeanors, and I noticed there were so many charges for possession of cannabis. Obviously, it's there, it's legal now in Oregon too, but do you think that that long-term tenuous relationship uh, with the prison system and uh, with uh, possession of marijuana has something to do with the fact that so few people of color in, in the industry? Oh yeah, the the two are totally interrelated, and you know this sector. It, there's so many dimensions to it, and I consciously chose not to deal with that directly in my work with workers. But here's a few things I can share with you in terms of like my opinion or anecdotes that that I've learned. Um, there are very few cannabis companies that have been consistent with their support of decriminalization and addressing you know the unfairness in the prison population when there was all this momentum to legalize many people you know let's say white people business people supported the idea of decriminalization addressing the you know the problem with um too many people of color in jail 
and then those that discourse was very effective and i think as uh, cannabis became legalized in colorado and elsewhere that issue has sort of fallen to the a back burner and doesn't get the attention that it needs um there is one exceptional organization the drug policy alliance and i'm sure there's others that are doing some really good work but i think the main dominant you know traditional cannabis sector sort of dropped the ball on this issue and they could do a lot more um and of course there's no doubt our history in our country you know the prison industrial complex it, it's just it, it's an embarrassment it's a, a, a it just it's a money pit and um, I do recognize that the prisons, um, they were one of the main lobbyists against uh, uh, the legalization of cannabis um, for, for different reasons. And so, yeah, I think um, more, you can have a special show just on the prison industrial complex, cannabis, and how it's partly responsible for so many um, dark faces or, or non-white faces in, in prison. And I'll never forget when I started getting involved with cannabis, and it started to be um, clear that there's going to be stores on the corner and you can go into a store and buy cannabis. My wife asked me, so does this mean that all those people in jail who are black or Latino that had minor possession charges or some other trumped up charge from cannabis, does this mean they should be let out? And I'm like, that seems pretty commonsensical to me because people now mostly white people making a lot of money off of cannabis and there's uh, you know our comrades in jail because of this this commodity that they sold um you know that they weren't within the bounds of the law at that time so yeah it's a major injustice and um, any a dissertation or two can easily be written about this just in the denver metro area yeah uh certainly it's uh, yeah and as you said we could do an entire episode and you know obviously the for-profit prison system too uh kind of blows this stuff up as well um uh so do you think also there's a relationship too between the ability to have capital or you know so that you're talking about uh just uh nor um uh state normal states of inequality quality within society that prevents, uh, you know, people of color from having the ability to invest in this industry as well? Is that is that also something you've come across or is it more leaning towards uh, the long term history uh, um, uh, of uh, the uh, uh, incarceration system? Yeah, I, again, I think all this is interrelated. If you look today to see who runs and owns many of these companies, it's mostly, you know, white people that have access to capital. And we just live in a system where, you know, with institutionalized racism, if you and I are bankers, I mean, historically, you know, if you have people of color come in and want money, if they don't have the capital or have limited access, or um, we just maybe find we'd rather work with white people. Um, you know, there's these structures that exist that are um, part and parcel to the cannabis sector that are not necessarily changing. Um, there's been some states to try setting up the law to make it um, like fair to provide maybe exceptions for people of color to get licenses. I know Maryland, if I remember correctly, and also in, in California, but there's also been claims from business owners that it's it's um discrimination you know you can't discriminate a white person and provide some you know a person of color some special circumstance so it's it's again i don't see many changes in the future uh, i just think we need a lot of education for consumers but also for um people at the front end of the in in the companies themselves when they have conversations to talk about these things and how they are real in part of any kind of conversation we talk about cannabis for medical or recreational purposes so um do you see anyone in the industry trying to address these particular issues or as you said you said it mostly fell away but there, are there individuals who are trying to kind of undo some of this stuff or trying to move in a more progressive route towards um, uh, including people of color? Not really. I mean, I know if I, I, you know, spent some time, I could probably find a couple people. The people I respect and admire that are working on these issues are not necessarily working in cannabis. Um, so there's many great community leaders, community activists working on the, you know, the, the for-profit uh, prison issue. But I think there's, even for people of color to work consistently on cannabis, there's stigma associated with that. 
Um, and even in the, within the university as a professor, you know, who's using my position to do good evidence-based, high quality policy influential research, you know, I know there's professors and others that maybe looked at me like, oh, he's just doing, you know, cannabis and, you know, he's just sort of getting high on the corner. And I just, <laughs> I just sort of don't subscribe to that at all. It's like a really um, shallow way to think about, you know, using our knowledge and using our um, our camaraderie with community members to sort of promote change and force, again, accountability and transparency in this really important and vibrant sector. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, one question, and I know there's a, I've heard this all over the place, and I'm sure some of it's hearsay, but there, there may be some basis in fact, is that one of the reasons that things like rent prices have gone up is because of the cannabis industry uh, in Denver. Have you heard or come across any of that kind of stuff where it's creating, because uh, obviously on one hand, the, the money that is being produced and the taxes that are being produced are providing all kinds of stuff for education. Uh, I read a thing about addressing homelessness the other day that, that they're using some of that tax money, all kinds of really interesting projects that's that, that Denver is able to do that wasn't able to do before this because they have more revenue. But, uh, but have the, has there been negative impacts on the city, on the city of Denver in particular? Yeah, I mean, no doubt. I mean, gentrification, um, the skyrocketing rents in uh, Denver. In fact, I think in the last week I read something that Denver to rent is more expensive than San Francisco or New York, which is insane. Um, and I think many people who do research on this don't necessarily look at cannabis as a primary vehicle for driving up rents, but it's definitely part of the context and landscape on which Denver is becoming or how people in Denver are having a hard time affording uh, the changes in price in uh, rents and other expenses. So I'm familiar with this issue in terms of the zip code in the Denver metro area, 80216. That zip code covers the neighborhoods Globeville, uh, Swansea, and El, El Aria, and those those communities in that zip code have the highest number of licensed facilities for cannabis production um, in in the universe. Uh, and so that community has seen gentrification. It's kind of the Rhino. It's on the border of the Rhino area, and it it covers the like Perina Dog Chow area in um, in in Denver. And so there's cross streets for context for people who don't obviously don't know Denver or, you know, or, or is that, is that close to downtown or those kind of things? Yeah. It's just about a, a mile or and a half or so uh, North of downtown oh. of downtown Denver. It's all along the I 70 corridor sort of between the 25 and then maybe, um, you know, Colorado Boulevard roughly. Um, so yeah, people have been, you know, community advocates, other community members, trying to, number one, to make sense of the issue, and then number two, trying to figure out, like, really what recourse do they have if old warehouses that maybe were abandoned previously and now have been turned into cannabis cultivation facilities, you know, how do they deal with their new community neighbor that has put up fences and barbed wire and cameras and, and created, in a way, like, you know, one of these um, you know, like a township in, in Soweto where in South Africa where it, they're not very welcoming. And then on top of that, people have seen uh, people forced out of their homes because of increases in, in rents. Um, and so the big ripple effect is, you know, people coming out of the woodwork to either build bridges with cannabis company owners to try to understand how to live with them and maybe make them more engaged along community lines or to be more aggressive and push companies out that maybe are not responsive or just for some reason are in an area of town where the community just finds they'd prefer them not to be there. Um, and, and so there's a lot of work to be done, number one, to understand the problem and then try to provide uh, people and communities with resources and other things that they may, may need um, to effectively address this problem. Sure. So uh, tell us a little bit about, because you also do a lot of digital storytelling and you did digital story, storytelling workshops and those kind of things. How do you integrate digital storytelling with this anthropo anthropological research and what kind of benefits have you seen using that particular methodology? Okay. Yeah, I just love the visual stuff. Um, and for background, again, you know, I got my show, Getting High on Anthropology. You were kind enough to be a guest. 
and I hope we can uh, reciprocate even more, you know, next year as we can get updated with each other. And for people watching this, I mean, doing visual anthropology, doing visual research, um, creating good content using visual imagery is really important because it helps um, sort of take the stuff from the written page and put it in something tangible that you can relate to. And honestly, with visual imagery and um, moving pictures, when you have people talk, people really don't know much until they can actually explain it. And so it's different to have a conversation like this than if I just said, Michael, here's my paper, read it for an hour and have people listen to you. So, so I'm a firm believer in looking at anthropological research along visual lines and then using visual strategies to build relationships with community members. Um, and the vehicle or the method is digital storytelling um, besides you know, public access TV or YouTube videos um, or documentary films. So I've been working for several years with this model um, formulated by the Center for Digital Storytelling out of Berkeley, now called Story Center. And so I've been very fortunate to learn their model and apply it with different community members on a range of issues. And the model is very basic. It's a workshop model. You get 10 people, two or three facilitators, all the equipment, and then you have 24 hours of instruction over three days or five days. And basically, it's a, a workshop setting where people in the community come together and share narratives. They share stories about particular issues, whether it's cannabis and gentrification or hepatitis or um, you know, uh, uh, issues of uh, place in different neighborhoods. Um, and then after three days, people are trained in the uh, art of storytelling, and then they create their own narratives. They type them up, they record them with facilitators' help, and they learn some very basic editing. And then, of course, the major um, uh, part of the process is watching the videos on a big screen um, inside the workshop, which is really fulfilling, especially for people who've never had experience making a video and then they come into a workshop and know how to make a video. And so this digital storytelling process, the bottom line, it creates these narratives that are people's stories as opposed to Marty's videos about these people. And so it's those stories that tend to... Um, these personal stories that when you watch them, they tend to have an emotional effect on people because they're they're genuine, they're heartfelt, and they pull at people's strings emotionally, and that pulls people further into the issues to want more or to then, and this is the gold standard, to then have people open to sharing their stories. And then you get this uh, sort of uh, process where there's uh, story sharing and story uh, gathering. Um, and those stories are data, they're anthropological data, but they're also vehicles for fundraising. And then they're also um, excellent ways for partners in communities to get content for their websites that can demonstrate to others, especially funders, on some of the innovative work that they're doing. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like a very rich data site because you're you're promoting conversations, you're promoting uh, community collaboration. Uh, I'd imagine that once you build those strong community, then you have an opportunity to help craft policy and engage with uh, you know government entities and those kind of things. Um, so uh, we only have a few minutes left, but I, I wanted to ask you. Um, what value does anthropology have to the cannabis industry? Wow, yeah, that's a very profound uh, question. So I think the the primary value is that it brings in a set of tools and a, a particular way of looking at the process of cannabis as a commodity, as an industry, as a set of regulations, a, a standpoint that normally is not seen. Um, and, and so each anthropologist is going to bring something different. You know, some anthropologists, depending on who they're funded by, maybe just want the perspective of industry people. Um, with my interest in labor and occupational health and safety, I'm interested in, in workers. And so I'm interested in individuals trying to identify patterns or you know, understanding their story and then connecting the stories and try to feature them in ongoing discussions where people are learning about the cannabis sector or they just need a narrative to help maybe substantiate some point going on. And so 
with a lot of the work I do as a visual anthropologist, you know, getting visual imagery, whether a short narrative or a short uh, video, um, that is a concrete way, similar to an academic article, of, of contributing knowledge to ongoing discussions and debate. And of course, having feedback to then determine what are the priorities that uh, we could focus on as anthropologists interested in culture to understand um, how the cannabis culture itself could work better, again, for more people, or it could just be done differently in a way that's um, more fair and reasonable for those individuals that either work or uh, purchase um, cannabis. Sure. Well, uh, thank you for coming on today. Do you have anything, any final thing to contribute or say or any particular things you'd like to, to go back to real quick? Uh, yeah, I mean, again, the most important thing for me is uh, corporate accountability and transparency. Um, one of the things that anthropologists are contributing to, including myself, is trying to understand what companies who are involved in cannabis, what are they doing to make themselves seem like they are responsible corporate citizens? So if I go to Starbucks, I go to McDonald's, I go to Pepsi, there's all this wonderful literature about, you know, sustainability practices and how they're helping Juan in Costa Rica, you know, with the farm that's a cooperative format or whatever. So I'm interested to document using anthropological tools the difference between what the cannabis companies do versus what they actually do. So there's things that they say in all their corporate social responsibility initiatives that conflict with their actual practices. And so what anthropology brings to the table is like, okay, how do we understand what's going on here? And then how do we systematically gather data to demonstrate that companies who claim that they're responsible and they care about the environment may not actually be true to these principles when you look at their behavior in the workplace with how they either have poor um, environmental practices or they actually obstruct workers' rights in terms of fair wages, in terms of um, you know workplace protections, in terms of workers who choose to uh, unionize or engage in collective bargaining. So I'm really interested to spread knowledge about this and build alliances with people that want to put together a accurate portrait of how this stuff is unfolding and then be able to participate in it to, uh, again, force accountability and transparency. Sure. Well, uh, thank you for coming on to the show today. Uh, Marty, it was, a, it was a pleasure having you. Uh, stick around in the green room for a few minutes and we could talk about a few things. Uh, but don't uh, forget to check out uh, Marty's show, Getting High on Anthropology. And of course, my other show that's a companion to this series, Anthropology in 10 or Less. Uh, also, feel free to uh, check out our Patreon page uh, to support both this show and Anthropology in 10 or Less to help us get more episodes up faster. Um, uh, and that's all for this time. And uh, uh, again, thanks for coming on, Marty. All right. Thanks again, Michael.